This is the third video in my sequence of videos on explaining materialism. It's about purpose and entropy. Now after the first video I produced on this in this series, I got lots of questions about things like whether human intelligence would be able to offset the heat death of the universe or offset the increase in entropy. And <clears throat> this talk is going to go into more detail about what entropy is and will be a bit more technical. But it's worth sticking with it because it's my opinion that borrowing concepts from physics or learning concepts from physics and applying them to society and political economy is critical to the redevelopment and rejuvenation of Marxist science. Now, in this talk, I'm going to be relying on a number of famous materialists who you'll come to know as I go through this. I finished off the last talk speaking about purposeful work and we established that purposeful labour depends on the ability to form and follow goals and a goal is a representation of a state of affairs that doesn't exist plus a motivation to achieve it. Now although goal, though, although bees do not have the kind of goal processing capabilities that we have they can still follow simple goals. Goal processing from simple reactive programs hardwired in the neural circuitry of insects to the much more adaptive and sophisticated rational planning capabilities of humans is the mechanism that distinguishes the constructive activity of humans and bees from the blind efforts of steam engines. I say there's a difference between purposeful work and work in the engineering sense, the work done by a steam engine. But any purposeful work that we do overcomes physical resistance and it involves work in the physical sense as well, work measured in watts, for which we have to be fueled by calories of food. The hidden connection here, though, it came from the realisation or the thought that perhaps purposeful labour could itself be a source of fuel. Maybe it works both ways. We know that work can be converted into heat by friction, and heat could be converted into work by a steam engine. But if you convert work into heat and, back, and heat back into work, you always end up with less work than you put in. Thermodynamics had established that. But James Clark Maxwell suggested that given intelligent purpose, you might be able to extract work from nothing. The essence of Maxwell's idea was that the tendency of entropy to increase was just a consequence of our large size and poor senses. He said that if there was a being that was an intelligent being that was small enough to be able to perceive individual molecules as they moved and could act on that, this being could actually start to extract energy from its intelligent action. Suppose you have a cylinder with gas at a uniform temperature, divided by a partition with a trap door in it, a very tiny trap door, which is operated by this intelligent being. He didn't call it a demon, but it's subsequently been named Maxwell's demon. When the demon sees a particle 
heading towards the trapdoor that is of above average speed coming from direction A, like this one, he lets it through. If he sees a particle of below average speed coming from B, he lets it through into A. So only opens the door for fast particles from A or slow particles from B. All other ones bounce off the door. After a while, you end up with the cold atoms, the slow cold atoms in partition A and the hot atoms, the fast hot atoms in partition B. So here an exercise in purposeful labour by the demon has outwitted the laws of thermodynamics. It has made heat flow from a cold place to a hot place and you can then use this heat to drive a steam engine or some other heat engine. Maxwell's demon has therefore reduced the entropy of a closed system. Concept of entropy was introduced by a guy called Clausius in 1865 with the equation that the change in S, which is entropy, is equal to the change in the quantity of heat divided by the temperature to which it's supplied. So S is the change of a, in entropy of a system consequent on the addition of heat, delta Q, at absolute temperature T. Now according to Clausius' equation, adding heat to a system increases its entropy and subtracting its heat lowers its entropy. But the magnitude of the change is inversely proportional to the temperature of the system. Thus if a certain amount of heat is transferred from a hotter to a cooler region, the increase in entropy in the cooler region will be greater than the reduction in entropy in the hotter region and the overall entropy rises. So this is the point that the entropy of a closed system tends to increase because heat flows from hotter to colder areas. Conversely, if we transfer heat from a colder to a hotter area, then by Clausius equation we reduce the entropy of the system. And this is what Maxwell appears to be saying you can do. What's wrong with Maxwell's argument? Could purposeful activity by a small being reduce the entropy of a system? More generally, could human intelligence bring a halt to the heat death of the universe? Just in case you think this is entirely fanciful, that there could be such tiny machines or tiny beings that could open and close gates and allow individual atoms in. Well, there are things like that in cell membranes. For instance, there's the calcium channel in a cell membrane, which regulates the relative concentration of calcium ions inside and outside the cell membrane, which can open like a trap door to let in uh, calcium ions into the cell. Now, the issue therefore is, could a purposeful machine like that be so constructed as, for example, to only let in sodium ions through a membrane and maintain a positive potential inside a cell membrane, which could then be used to drive metabolic activities. So the, the, the idea of something tiny that regulates the movement of individual atoms is not unreal or unrealistic. But Marx said there's no royal road to science. To understand why the answer to all these questions is no, we need to delve deeper into, an, into atomism and the atomic theory of entropy developed by Boltzmann. Now, in talking about this, I'm going to use some fairly abstract concepts, but they're well worth grasping because the modern econophysics analysis of political economy the econophysics-based Marxian political economy, relies heavily on concepts of entropy. Before Boltzmann, thermodynamics was an empirical science related to raising the performance 
of heat engines like steam engines, Stirling engines, etc., and studying how heat flowed. It was purely empirical, driven by the desire to build more efficient steam engines. He moved it from that to a, an actual theory about atoms. And this theory about atoms explains why entropy tends to increase. He showed that entropy was actually a statistical property of the position and motions of gas molecules. One of Boltzmann's formulae for entropy is the S formula. I've, this is a slight variation. It's sometimes called the H formula, where H form, the, the H is a negative version of the S formula. What it's saying here is the entropy S is a function of the integral of F and log F, where F is a function which counts the number of molecules in a given volume V. Now, the volume he was talking about is a rather abstract type of volume called the volume of phase space. But Rather than go into what phase space means, I'm going to just assume that we pursue the argument with literal physical space. And I'll give examples with literal physical space. Now, I want to show that something which we know will take place will result in a rise in entropy. And since I'm doing a very coarse model, the function f is always going to return an integral number of atoms or molecules. In principle, it, it could give some real number, fractional real number, which is the probable number of molecules that will be in a volume, in which case the entropy function gives positive values. Here it gives negative values. Now, if we start out in this configuration, two atoms on the left-hand side, four on the right-hand side, and they're bouncing around. And we apply, and we assume the volumes that we're adding up are this volume on the left and that volume on the right. They're both equal volumes. If we apply Boltzmann's formula to that, we get that has an entropy of just below minus three. If we open the the barrier here, we would expect the pressure to equalize on both sides. Now the things will jiggle around and occasionally there will be four on this side and two on that side, but you would expect it to end up with three on each side, same, roughly the same number on each side. Now if you ca calculate with Boltzmann's formula, you find that this has an entropy of minus 2.46. Oh, you might say entropy's gone down, but remember the sign. This is actually an increase in entropy. The entropy has gone up from minus 3 to minus 2.8. So just that statistical rearrangement of the atoms gives rise to an increase in entropy. Now, the nice thing about Boltzmann's formula, though, is that he constructed an elaborate argument from assuming that the atoms bounce around like billiard balls and looked at the likely spread of directions they'll bounce off and the relative speeds they'll bounce off with in order to show that the dynamics of the system will lead to this rise in entropy. He also had another formula for it, where he says the entropy is the logarithm of the number of microscopic states or configurations of atoms compatible with a given macro state. Well, the given macro state in this case would be higher pressure on that and lower pressure here. The macro state here is equal pressure throughout. Now, the what he's saying is that the entropy is proportional to the 
logarithm of the number of possible states that can produce that. I'm not going to work through examples to convince you of this. Um, what's significant about this is that he showed that atoms bouncing off one another like billiard balls in what microscopically is a reversible fashion will over time tend to increase s. That is to say, something which is microscopically reversible generates an irreversible change over time. And this is a real dialectical development, going from something which logically, at the microscopic level, is reversible, to concluding that at the macroscopic level, it's irreversible. The rise in entropy is an irreversible process. So this rise in entropy is what gives rise to the arrow of time, to the difference between past and future. And systems are constantly evolving towards more probable states. But it was still not possible with Boltzmann's arguments to explain why Maxwell's demons couldn't reduce entropy. To do that you needed two more steps, steps which weren't taken until the mid-20th century. The first was to show that entropy and information are related, and the second was to understand what is involved in making logical decisions, understand physically what is involved in making logical decisions. The first step came with Shannon who in the 1940s showed that information can be measured in entropy units. He was working for Bell Labs and concerned with the transmission of telex messages across wires and concerned with the channel of these wires. And to do that you need a way of measuring the information transmission rate of a channel. What he showed that if you're sending data using some kind of code like the ASCII code, the information content per symbol of the code is given by Shannon's entropy formula, which is minus the sum of, over all symbols, minus P of si the, the probability of symbol S occurring times log to the base 2 of the probability of symbol S occurring. Now this is essentially the same relation that Boltzmann has. It's a probability multiplied by the log of a probability. In Boltzmann's case it's a function which does a count of molecules which is essentially the same sort of thing as a, a probability. There are some differences Shannon entropy is managed in, in bits, not in joules per degree Kelvin, but it's very useful in measuring how compressible a data stream is. You will be watching this using an MPEG-4 video channel or an H.264 video channel. All such video compressors first do various tricks which are lossy tricks to throw away information which we don't perceive and can be safely thrown away. It then generates a code which goes through an entropy compressor which gives you a stream of output in which the binary ones and the binary zeros are equiprobable because the more uneven the probability of symbols, more uneven the probability of ones and zeros is, the lower the entropy of the data stream. If you can generate a data stream which not only looks like an equal number of ones and zeros, but they appear to be completely random in the order they arrive at, you've achieved maximal entropy and you've achieved the maximum compression of your data stream. If you're considering ordinary text, where the letter E, for example, is much more probable than the letter V or the letter Z, if you store these in ASCII code, each of them takes 8 bits. 
and it turns out the entropy of English text is much more like something like four bits per character. And if you feed the thing through a zip compressor, which is an entropy compressor, you end up with a file roughly half the size because you've, re you've reduced it to the maximum, sorry, the minimum number of bits required to represent the inherent entropy of the information. There are similarities to Boltzmann entropy. I said the Boltzmann entropy is maximized when the gas is evenly spread out across the volume. And the equivalent in Shannon entropy is that the entropy of data is maximized when the probability of symbols is evenly spread out. I gave the example of the probability of ones and zeros being equal. Or if you're using a fixed length code, an 8-bit code, you'd have to have each possible code letter would have to have 1256 of a probability arriving. But all this is still talking about pictures, text, etc. It doesn't relate information to heat. For that you have to go to someone else, Landauer. He said suppose you've got an AND gate. It takes in two bits A and B and produces an output Y. It's clear, therefore, that it must destroy one bit of information. You've got two bits going on in and one bit coming out. What happens to the destroyed bit? Well, what Landauer said is that if information is equivalent to entropy, the destroyed bit has to be turned into heat. Because otherwise, the entropy of the system would have been reduced. And you can't reduce the entropy of a system. So, an entropy equivalent to one bit must go out as heat. You can work out how much heat is going to come out. He says that the formula is Boltzmann's constant times temperature times the natural log of two joules. So, any AND gate must dissipate a minimum amount of energy given by Landauer's law every time it operates. Back in the 1980s in my lectures on computer design and computer history, I used to use examples from Landauer's law to show the ultimate heat limits that would be met by computing chips. Uh, using Landauer's law, I used to get some sort of limit to the clock speed of computers between 100 and 1,000 gigahertz, would, would, they would be dissipating too much heat. Uh, you can use other types of um, projections in terms of the capacitance of the gates in a, a chip and the um, charge that's being dissipated each time they switch, and you get a much more realistic estimate because Landauer is assuming perfectly efficient circuits to do this no resistance, no capacitive losses. The losses are only due to information loss. It's a very small quantity of energy, but it can actually be measured. People have measured the Landauer energy of a gate. I'm now moving from work done by famous people to some experiments I've done myself on Maxwell's demons. The picture on the right here is a picture of one of the boards of a computer I designed in the 1990s, which we called the Space Machine. Its aim was to break with the normal method of building computers since von Neumann, which is to have a memory separate from the processing elements and a computer which you program in terms of software. Instead, it was a computer made out of reconfigurable logic in which the bits of information, the memory bits, were integrated closely 
with the logic circuits. And if you program it, you program it in terms of the interconnection between these logic elements. So it used field programmable gate arrays, but used a particularly nice type of field programmable gate array designed by a guy called Tom Keane in Edinburgh. The types of problems we were working on were road traffic simulation and lattice gases. Now the lattice gas experiments are the ones that I'm going to focus on. A lattice gas is a kind of digital model of a gas in which the molecules are assumed to move on a fixed lattice, usually a hexagonal lattice. So that they can only move in these directions. And when molecules collide, they collide at these center points and the directions they move off in have to follow the laws of Newtonian mechanics. And if you simulate very large numbers of these molecules moving like that, your simulated gas behaves like a real gas. And you can use it to simulate gas flow, for example. Now, the computer we built was designed to be joined together in large racks my target was that if I built something as big as MIT's connection machine, it would be a million times faster than the connection machine. I didn't have MIT's money, so we never built more than four of these boards with 16,000 processing elements per board. Now, in order to check whether the lattice gases were actually behaving as gases, I needed some kind of experiment which I could test a gas without having to stop the computer. The computer simulated the whole thing so bloody fast that there was no point trying to visualize it because you'd have to keep stopping every clock cycle to see where the, the gas molecules were. So what I hit on was the idea of making a simulated organ pipe and to see whether that resonated at a particular frequency. By if I supplied sound to it, I should hit the resonant frequency of the organ pipe and with a simulated microphone connected to headphones, I'd be able to listen for the resonant frequency. The question then was, how do I make in a lattice gas something which is equivalent to a loudspeaker? Well, the way I did it was to have rows of Maxwell demon cells interper interpolated between the lattice gas cells at one end of the tube. If I feed a sound wave into these Maxwell demon cells, they became active. When they became active, they pumped the gas from here to here. They pumped the gas from there to there, from the area which is shown as at lower pressure into the high pressure. Now that's something which should be impossible on entropic grounds. But how do we actually do this? It worked, by the way. The Maxwell demon cells did pump gas out. I could pick out a resonant frequency of sound. I had to slow my computer down from 5 megahertz to 30 kilohertz. It was so, so fast but I had to slow the clock speed right down in order to get a, um, a sound wave that was in the audible range, but I did that. But this is how I built the Maxwell Demon cells. Consider the rules that a Maxwell Demon has to follow. If I've got a atom coming in from the left here, the Demon cell must evolve to a state where it emits an atom to the right. That's the first rule. On the other hand, if an atom comes in from the right, I want that atom to bounce back. And if atoms come in from both sides, the atoms come into the cell and bounce off one another. Now, logically, we can sum this out as saying the right out signal is equal to the left in signal or right in and not left in. That summarizes those three rules. And you can build 
an electronic circuit like this. This is the electronic circuit which would generate the right output signal. Notice that it has two, two input in gates here, an OR gate and an AND gate. Now by Landau's law, the two input gates are going to require a minimum of 2 times KT log N2 joules to operate each time they switch. Now this would apply whatever technology the Maxwell's demon was built of. Even if it was the most efficient technology possible, it has to perform these two logical operations, each of which destroy a bit of information. So Maxwell's demon can't actually be a free source of energy. The actual process of making the decision is dissipating heat and therefore requires a source of energy to run it. There's no getting away from the laws of thermodynamics. Even something as apparently purposeful as Maxwell's demon must dissipate energy that goes as wasted heat. Now it's important to deduce that all this, all of this, was a series of deductions from atomism. The process goes from Lucretius to Maxwell's atomic theory of gases, to Boltzmann's statistical mechanics of those gases, to Shannon studying information theory and recognizing that he'd come up with the same formula as Boltzmann, and then Landauer unifying these. Landauer's law, of course, is important because it sets ultimate limits to what we can do with computers. It sets ultimate limits to the efficiency of computers and the computational power that we'll achieve. It shows that Moore's law, the law that computer power doubles every 18 months, cannot be sustained indefinitely. My next lecture is going to be more of a challenge to me because it's dealing with very much more recent research, which is England's work on thermodynamics and life. So it may take me a bit longer to prepare that one.